Good afternoon and welcome to our 4-H virtual science cafe. We're so happy you could join us this afternoon. I'm Laura Wilson. I'm a 4-H science professional with 4-H. And if you're not familiar, 4-H is a community for all kids with programs that suit a variety of backgrounds, interests, budgets, and schedules from in-school to after school, 4-H clubs, 4-H camp and learning centers. Our positive youth development programs are available in your local community. And we welcome every kid who wants to have fun, learn, and grow. 4-H is the youth development program of the University of Maine, brought to you by the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. I hope you all take a second to introduce yourself in the chat box. Please just share your name and your town, if you would, that'd be fantastic. Here at Maine 4-H, uh, we have Alice Philbrook monitoring the chat and Jesse Brainerd is hosting our Q&A today. Also working behind the scenes, I'll be um, helping out so that all of this runs smoothly. We're gonna keep this session simple today. Our guest will share some of who, her cool research and a bit about herself. She's got some really cool photos to share with us today. And then we'll have plenty of time for you to ask questions. We'll use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to get questions to her. Quick note about the chat. We'd love to see your reactions to what our guest presents, but please keep on topic in the chat and we'll be able to keep chat open for you today. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carissa Tilbury. Dr. Tilbury, would you please tell our participants about yourself and your work? Absolutely. Um, so I'm Dr. Carissa Tilbury. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Maine. I have been in Maine for almost four years. And before that, I did a postdoc at Vanderbilt University in the Biophotonics Center. And then before that, I got my PhD from the University of Wisconsin in biomedical engineering there. And before that, I was actually a 4-H kid growing up um, and was in a chapter called the Hubbles and Hustlers. Um, so I'm very excited to share sort of STEM opportunities and participate as a STEM person in your 4-H programming. All right, can I go ahead and share my screen now? That we should be able to. Yeah, thank you. All right. All right, so today I'm gonna to talk, talk to you a little bit about my research. Um, so my title in here is Decoding the Interaction of Light and Tissue. So before I get go ahead and get started, I have one question for you. There's gonna be a series of questions throughout this presentation, which I understand are set up in the poll questions already, so you can put your response there. Oh, all right, poll right there. So the first question is, which of the following are applications of light in healthcare? We have pulse oximetry, Fitbit watches. You can use application in healthcare pretty broadly. It doesn't have to be just a doctor using it. Ultrasound, MRI, or both pulse oximetry and Fitbit watches. So we'll give people a couple minutes to answer the poll questions. And once they have done once I've finished answering them, I can share the results so we can all see them. And over 80% of our guests have filled out the poll. So I'm going to go ahead and end it. And uh, well, everybody has. I'm going to end the poll and share the results right now with you. All right. A and B is the correct answer, 42%. It's a little bit of a trick question. I like throwing multiple choice, multiple answer questions sometimes. All right, so pulse oximetry and Fitbit watches are both commonly used. I have a Fitbit on my hand right now. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit of how the light that's in your Fitbit, so if you turn it upside down, you see lights that are flashing, you might see a green light. There's probably also another light that maybe you can't see because it's in a wavelength reach region that your eye is not able to detect well. So you just answer for, we have a question of what does MRI stand for? Oh, came in. MRI stands for a magnetic resonant imaging approach. 
So it's, um, if you've ever had to go to the hospital for some sort of imaging approach and you get slid onto this little cot that goes into a magnetic coil and the magnetic coils go around and then depending on how um, the interaction with the electromagnetic waves are with the tissue structures that you have, you get contrast from those images there. Does that answer that question? I think so, thank you. All right, sounds good. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the evolution of light in health. So we have our first microscope that was used to observe the cell by a monk in 1665 and a very, very simple microscope. And then, you know, light in healthcare kind of, it was an ongoing process, but it was, wasn't really until the 1970s that we introduced pulse oximetry. So that wasn't that long ago. I guess it's like 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Um, I guess we're in 2020 at this point. I keep on forgetting what year it is. Um, but that's when we first introduced pulse oximetry. So for those of you on the phone, which are probably all too young for this reference, I'm actually too young for this reference, but I watched all the original series because it's great. And I think you can still watch the original series on Amazon or uh, Netflix right now, but Star Trek. So in Star Trek, they have this imaginary tool that Dr. McCoy carries around and it does everything called the tricorder and it, it diagnoses and treats. So what was really remarkable about that show is there was nothing even remotely close to that in the world at that point in time, because 1972 is when pulse oximetry debuted. In 1992, if you wear glasses and you're sick of wearing them, um, 1992 is when LASIK surgery was in invented, so you could have your eye vision corrected without wearing contacts or glasses. In 1997, uh, something in my field that's sort of the miracle tool called optical coherent tomography. So what you're seeing on the screen with the little boy having his, pressing his eye against that, that screen and the image that you're seeing is actually of his retina. So you're looking at different layers of the retina through a technique called optical coherent tomography, which is similar to ultrasound, but it's looking at how light instead of sound is scattering off of different layers. And then in 2010, introduced the Fitbit era. Um, so now Fitbits look somewhat different from those, but they still operate on the same thing. And then going back to the tricorder era of wanting to get those, we see the winner of a competition that was to make the tricorder from Star Trek and what, what physician scientists thought that that might look like to aid healthcare at this point in time. So if we, if we want to use light to understand how um, it's going to interact for both diagnostic and maybe therapeutic purposes, we need to understand how light is going to interact with the tissue. So we can have a couple different op options that the light can do. It can have immediately reflect off the tissue that you see in the blue arrows here. You can have penetration where it maybe it, it is maybe absorbed or scattered, which you see in the green arrows. And if the absorbed happens, your photon isn't gonna be able to emit out the surface of either the top or the bottom of this. So the lighter blue arrows here, we're seeing reflectance coming back out over this direction. And those are from photons that are scattered deeply within this tissue structure here. And then depending on where you're measuring, if you're measuring through a finger like you would be through a pulse oximetry, your finger is thin enough that you're able to actually get light detected on the other side of it, and we call those transmission photons. So light interactions with tissue include both scattering and absorption. And we fortunately are able to measure some, some ratio of how much scattering versus how much absorption is going to be there. And those aspects are going to be dependent on what wavelength you use. So here we have an image of the same person down here. So this is all the same person, not me. Um, his name is Bruce Chomberg, and he was a professor at University of California, Irvine, but now he's uh, the director of NIH National Institutes of Biomedical Engineering and Bioengineering Imaging. And he is a crazy guy, and he sometimes does weird things like putting LEDs in his mouth. 
So what you're seeing here is what happens after he put a blue LED in his mouth, a green LED, and a red LED in his mouth, and taking pictures of his face. Now, I don't want any of you to try this at home because I don't want any parents emailing me asking me why their kids put LEDs in their mouth. This was under a supervised scientific in a professor's office, not done at home. But you can see that you see very different structures in this guy's face depending on which wavelength was in his mouth. Now a more safe experiment, but still you probably don't have the light sources to do this at home, is he used a light that was at 400 nanometers and he took an image without light shining on his face. And he did the same thing with a light at 850 nanometers and he took another picture of his face. And I don't think I have to knock it into you, but there's very different, there's very big differences that you see between these images. So at the shorter wavelength, you see a very freckled skin pattern. And at the longer wavelength, you see a much more homogeneous, smooth skin texture. So what I'm trying to drive home here is that depending on what wavelengths you're going to use, you see very different features. There's going to be very different interactions of light. And those interactions with light in the tissue are dependent on absorption and scattering purposes. And we're going to use that to decode information about what that tissue is, is telling us. So on to the next question. So true or false? Different wavelengths of light can alter how skin or tissue appear. I've got the poll up and they're answering really quickly. All right. Awesome, you guys are brilliant. Absolutely. So you saw that on the previous slide. So that's why, you know, maybe at Christmas time when you take that nice Christmas photo, you find the perfect light bulb that's gonna make your skin appear the most blemish free. All right. So what can we do with that different information about light? So one particular problem that I'm working on in my research group is trying to understand di diabetes, and particularly uh, a disease that comes as a result of being diabetic. So I'm assuming that most of you probably know someone in their life that suffers from diabetes and might have to prick themselves and take their blood glucose levels every day. So why people need to do that is they need to make sure that the rest of their body is gonna maintain proper nu nutritive flow and s keep those tissues alive and well. So one of the common things that happens to diabetics is they have this disease called diabetic polyneuropathy. So basically what that means is that their nerves die back. And then once their nerves die back, they can't feel the tissue, they can't maybe feel their toes, and they also aren't gonna be able to heal very well. And then they might end up with an amputation of their big toe, or maybe even worse, their foot. And that sounds very scary, and it is very scary, and it's very dominant. It happens a lot. In fact, if you look across the entire world, someone is getting their foot amputated every 30 seconds due to diabetic polyneuropathy. So the treatment and the diagnosis for it is really quite poor. So currently how you're diagnosed is literally a doctor touches your, your foot or your hands and asks with a filament, a little piece of plastic, and asks if you can feel it or not. So that's not very quantifiable. It's very subjective. You probably are anxious. You're thinking that you should be able to feel something and maybe you're saying yes, even though you can't say anything. Furthermore, by the time that you diagnose it in that approach, the damage is so severe that we can't actually treat it. There's no way to prevent the, the further loss of innervation or nerve or sensation that you have. So that led me to question, like, could we detect this earlier? Because I have lots of family members that have diabetes. So it turns out that if you go and look at the pathology or the physio physiology of diabetic polyneuropathy, we see that we have these vessels in our body. So we have arterioles, which are just small blood vessels that are carrying oxygenated blood. And those arterioles are going to lead up into these structures that are shown here in these purple loops called capillaries. And those arterioles have little nerves that are innervating, causing these arterioles to pulsate back and forth, to have variation of diameters. 
And that variation of diameters, while it doesn't seem to be that important, is dramatic. And it changes the way in which the flow through the blood is going to go through. So in, in diabetics, they've seen that these nerves die back. And then what happens is there, these arterioles aren't able to change their size. And then what happens is the resistance to flow in those vessels becomes so great that they're not going to go up into these capillaries and deliver nutrients and exchange gases to those tissues. So fun fact, if you're a cell and you're further away than 50 microns, so from a blood vessel, from one of these arterioles, you're not going to receive adequate nutrients. So 50 microns is really a very small distance. So if you look at one strand of your hair, a single hair is about 100 microns. So think about half of a single strand of hair. You have to be that, that close to a blood vessel supply in order to sustain life. So in diabetic neuropathy, when we get these dieback of nerves, we're not, we're, we're not going to get the flow up through these purple loops anymore. So you can imagine why wound healing is such a problem in diabetics. Damage in the first place is a problem because you're going to be a lot further than 50 microns away, those cells, to maintain health, health aspects. So now I've described to you the physiology of diabetic polyneuropathy. So if we could detect it at that level, maybe we could actually treat it and prevent it from getting worse. So when you guys go to Walmart or, or Walgreens or any other sort of big box re retailer store, you probably have seen these Dr. Scholl's custom fit orthotic center, right? You stand on it and you get what si which size orthotic you should, should wear. Maybe you haven't done this, but maybe you've watched your parents do that. So a kind of crazy out of the box idea is that instead of having this sort of screening protocol that we have right now for diabetic polyneuropathy, what if instead of selecting your, which insole you should use, what if instead we turn this machine into an approach that's gonna use light to try to understand how well are your nerves functioning and specifically how well are your nerves functioning around these arterioles? So that seems probably like a pretty crazy idea, but it's not as outlandish as you might think. So enter in spatial frequency domain imaging. So this is a schematic that you might have in um, inside that Dr. Scholl's machine. So we have three LEDs here of different wavelengths because we know that depending on what wavelength of light we use, we're gonna see different things. It's gonna encode various structures. So we're gonna have three of those. We're gonna combine them all. And then we're gonna use this DMD here. So this stands for a digital micromere device. So this isn't really anything fancy. This is the same thing, this, the three LEDs, oops. The three LEDs plus this DMD is effectively what is in every single projector you've ever used in your entire life. So basically I'm just recreating a projector and I'm gonna project patterns of light onto a particular tissue. So I can project that onto your face, I can project that onto your feet, I can project that onto your hand, wherever. And then I'm gonna simply take a picture of that projected light. So over here is a cartoon version uh, from a paper that is not my work, but I'm following in this work. Of We have two different wavelengths of light. So we have this blue wavelength and this red wavelength. And see that we have like bars being projected onto that tissue. So just like a barcode, we're gonna project a barcode of light onto your, onto your skin. And depending on the wavelength and the barcode frequency of light that we're gonna project, we're gonna sample different volumes of our tissue. So here we're seeing that we're sampling a much shallower version. So this is going to be the capillaries, those purple loops that we saw in the previous slide, versus the red light is going to penetrate deeper and it's going to get into this arterial region or the mic, the macro circulation. Okay. So they what they did is they did this on a bunch of human patient volunteers and they looked at the oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. So your blood carries oxygen with it. So what the pulse oximeter is measuring is how oxygenated your blood is. So what they're doing here is they're measuring the oxygenated versus the unoxygenated blood at two different layers, so the top and the bottom. So this is gonna be T1 and this is T2. 
So you can see that the hemoglobin maps, the oxyhemoglobin maps of those two different layers look very different. So that's giving you an indication of how the blood is flowing through your feet to meet the oxygen demands. So going back, circling back to that physiology, we'll be able to tell, hopefully, whether or not these arterioles are actually pulsating in size and have those nerves intact or not intact at a much earlier state than you can respond to if you feel a prick or not a prick on your toe or finger. Uh, hi, Dr. Tilbury. We have a couple of questions. For this screen right here, we have the question of what do all those lenses do? All these lenses, they are just culminating the light. So if you look at a light bulb in your room, in your house, right, you have this typically piece of glass surrounding it. And what the glass there is meant to do is it's meant to disperse it and allow the light to get into all the crevices of your room. And in this case, I don't want light to, to do that. I want it to be focused in on where I want the light to be directed to. So that's what those lenses are doing. Okay, and we've got one other question. What does chromophore mean? Chromophore, yeah. So a chromophore is a, a substance that um, is a tissue absorber. So remember on this slide, here, this green absorption or scattering. So a chromophore is going to be something that is absorbing light. So I'm not going to be able to detect the photons either transmitted through or reflected back out. And I should add that oxy and deoxyhemoglobin, it's sort of really small here. So this is two, two chromophores that are pretty common, are oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. And that's what your pulse oximetry is measuring. So if you see in red here, you have this oxyhemoglobin map, and it's a function of wavelength. So this is how absorbing it is. So it's very absorbing at blue-like wavelengths. And the ox deoxyhemoglobin is labeled here in blue, or HP, and it has a different. So just like in pulse oximetry, you have multiple wavelengths. So you're going to have a wavelength here, and then a wavelength here. So you're going to be able to dis distinct to, to differentiate what the absorber is by the ratios of that, those values. Any other questions? Nope, that's it for now. All right. All right, so a little bit under the hood. So I can create these beautiful images, right? And I can look at differences of, of my, micro and macro circulation. But exactly how, how do you go about doing it? So I have this image schematic set up. So also at the bottom of the slide, I have opensfdi.org, which is a website that I'm a part, part of creating material for. And if you go there, there's step-by-step -step instructions on how to make your own, very own spatial frequency domain imaging system. Um, and there's even some pseudocode there in order to look at how you go about processing these images. So I wanted to just take you a little bit further under the hood just to gather some sort of appreciation of what it takes to get to this point. So after you have the instrument built, you'd have to do, um, you have to of course acquire your, your data that you're interested in. And so this is a flow chart looking at how you might go about acquiring and then extracting and there's representative images over here. So I have two different frequencies. So I have a, a DC. So you see in this top row here, we have images that look like uniform light distribution throughout the entire thing. And then I have an AC frequency down here in this FX2. So at this point, this is looking like the bars that I'm projecting onto the tissue. So I'm going to take that bar and I'm going to rotate, I'm going to shift it in space or actually in, in phase here. So I have a sign pattern that's generating these bars and a sign pattern at zero. And then I'm gonna shift it over by 120 degrees. I'm gonna shift that so you can see that no longer are these bars in the same place, but they're still the same size bars. I'm gonna shift it once again, 240 degrees. And then I'm gonna go through a process called demodulation. 
And demodulation is a way in which I'm going to look at all these, I'm going to take all these images and combine them all into a single image and get rid of any phase information. So I'm going to collapse these down. And when I collapse these down, I'll effectively have a planar or an AC image that looks just like this. And the reason that this is important is because anything that's going to be the same across all those images, I'm going to get rid of. I'm not going to care about that anymore. And so from that, then I am into a space called diffuse reflectance space. And I'm going to get images that from that space, I can look at and understand how absorbing and how scattering are those particular tissues. So from these six images, I can get these two images. And then from these two images, I can look at particular tissue chromophores. So oxy and deoxy hemoglobin are shown here. So I have total oxy hemoglobin, total hemoglobin, total deoxy hemoglobin, and then percent saturated O2, which is our just derivatives of each other. So they're addition and subtraction of them. So all four of these images are coming from this particular new way image right here. We did have a quick question. Why do you use bars? I, the reason we use bars is it's just a really easy, simplistic pattern that we can use to project. So you could use any shape that you want, um, but you're going to make the math a lot more complex and there's not really an upside for it. So what I did over here is I took this flow chart and I showed you the front end screen of what our simulation, or, 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 I'm sorry, our analysis code looks like. We also have some of this for simulations on the other side. So it has multiple parts. So this is just sort of a loading in part up here. This is our demodulation part here. So it's gonna take these images and create a single image. And then we can create masks, we can do other things and it, it's gonna go down. So over here, you can see there's several functions that we're going to use. They're all being called from this main program to do all this work to eventually get us these images so that we can quantify what in fact is happening in that. So it's complex. There's lots of hands-on skills. There's lots of um, developing program skills and communicating with other people. So you don't have to be awesome at all of these, these skills but you need to be willing and curious to learn about, about these things. So that leads me to my last poll, poll question of the day, which is, what sort of skills will you develop working in biophotonics? We are almost there. We've got 90% of our participants have voted. I'll give them just a few more seconds and share the results. All right. All of the above, 80%. For those of you who said hands-on skills in computer programming, you are also correct. Um, but I just wanted to have all of the above and you, you notice that I also put in a love of learning because we're never perfect at any of these things as we go along. So in the next couple slides, I thought I'd show you, um, first of all, I thought I'd show you sort of some students that I have in my own lab that both started with me as freshmen and now one's entering their junior year and one just graduated and kind of what their pathways look like. And then I'll enter what my pathway looked like, and then I'll open it up to question and answers that you might have. All right, so these are the two students that I've had in my lab since their freshman year. So the top, her name is Jordan Minor, and she's an incoming senior in biomedical engineering. Now you don't have to major in biomedical engineering to be interested in biophotonics, but it is a pretty good major to choose. Um, so she's pictured up here. She won a poster presentation at the Northeast Biomedical Engineering Symposium, which was really an awesome feat um, because this conference is mostly attended by uh, postdocs. So postdocs is a, a thing they probably are not aware of what they are. So postdocs are people that already have gotten their PhDs and they're working in labs and receiving more training so that one day hopefully they might become 
professors or um, work in industry as well. So she won that in a field of lots and lots of postdocs. So that was really quite impressive. And in fact, she was competing against postdocs at institutions like MIT and Harvard and Boston University. And funny and real true story, she, I was not there at this conference. And when she returned, she told me that a professor from MIT thought that she was a third year postdoc and was floored when she told him that no, she was a third year undergrad. Um, he was also asking how we got such good images that we are seeing on her poster. So this is a, a different optical technique that I use in my lab. And we're looking at myosin in terms of health and that approach and understanding muscular dystrophy. So I'm happy to say that she is awesome. And she is now um, doing a virtual summer 2020 internship at the Goddard NASA Space Flight Center. So hopefully she gets to go down there and visit before the summer is, is done. And then she'll be coming back to UMaine campus and continue her work on the zebrafish project. And you know, I'm really excited to see where she goes. Possibilities are endless. I think she's gonna learn even more in terms of what's out there after this summer internship at NASA. Another story, um, Mitchell Harling, he is, he is not a junior in biomedical engineering. He just graduated. Uh, he's a 2020 alum. So he went out with me and a grad student, Wyatt Austin, picture on my left, um, and presented as an undergrad at the largest biomedical optics conference in the world. It's called SPIE Photonics West. And after they presented, we had a little bit of a fun day and we went and saw the Golden Gate Bridge and it was, it was great. So what other opportunities has he had? Um, so in the summer of 2018, he was an NIH National Institutes of Health intern, and he got to work in this research campus down by Washington, D.C. area. And where is he off to? Well, he's off to pursuing a PhD in biomedical engineering, where he's going to continue the work that he started um, in the biophotonics community as a PhD student in the probe lab at Brown University. So it's really, really, really exciting. And I'm thrilled to see where they end up. All right, so a little bit more about my pathway. So I um, grew up in rural Wisconsin. I had no idea what engineering was uh, until I was applying to college. I thought I wanted to go to medical school. And I was sitting in this seminar and I learned about biomedical engineering. I was like, wow, that's so cool. I had no idea that that was actually a major because I was kind of doing the classic debate. Do I do biology? Do I do biochemistry? You know, I, I really didn't know. Um, so I entered, I was a badger, um, really excited by that. Kind of dreamed about being a badger my entire life. So when I got accepted, that was exciting. I, um, as a freshman, I was, had a job on campus as a janitor and I really didn't want to be a janitor because it really sucks. So I found a different job and that led me to the first kind of purview into biomedical optics, but not in a healthcare way at all. So my first entrance into biomedical optics or optics in general was with this person here. So his, he was my undergraduate research advisor. His name is Scott Sanders and he's a mechanical engineering professor and he uses light to understand what's going on in the combustion process inside car engines. So, you know, really the farthest thing from my thought process, I wanted to do things that were related to health, not, and not car engines, um, but it was really cool. So basically he, you know, used the light, used different wavelengths and measured absorption coefficients across the, um, the cylinder ring in that approach. So um, through meeting him, I stuck with him all four years as an undergraduate researcher. He introduced me to Kevin L. Sigari, who also introduced me to Patty Keeley, and ultimately my PhD advisor, um, Paul Campanola. So I continued on at the University of Wisconsin at Madison for both undergrad and graduate careers. So this was our engineering hall building, and it had this really cool water fountain that we could control um, students could control the lights and how the water was coming out of it. And this is what the campus looks like at night. Highly, highly photoshopped um, to have that blur. And as part of my studies throughout all these groups, I was a participant 
active participant in a lab called LOCI, which stands for the Laboratory of Optical Computer and Instrumentation. And it was this really unique place. It was a place in which biologists, physicists, computer scientists, biomedical engineers, electrical engineers all came together and created instrumentation and then applied it to biology and health, health questions. So it was really the brainchild of Kevin Alcieri, and he was supported by lots of other PIs, both of which are pictured and I interacted with a lot. So Patty Healy and Paul Campanola were both active participants in that. So after I got my PhD in 2015, I did a short postdoc at Vanderbilt University um, in Nashville, Tennessee. This is a picture of the beautiful campus. It's very green in comparison. So I continued on this optical path. So what you're seeing here is T cells from mice. So two different types of T cells. So we have TH1s and TH17s. And what we're seeing in terms of their contrast here is the ratio of two enzymes, NADPH and FAD, which are autofluorescent, meaning that I can see their, they absorb. And then after they absorb, they emit some other color of light. And I can collect the other color of light after I, I excite them. And they do that without adding anything to them. So I can take that ratio and I can tell you sort of what sort of pathways is a cell using in terms of um, metabolic process. And why that's particularly important is we can understand cancer that way. We can understand differentiation of stem cells. Um, and we can also understand how, what type of T cell we have, which is becoming more and more important in terms of understanding immune cell function, both in terms of viruses, bacterial infections, cancer, etc. So then the last step was really here as an assistant professor. And I traded in my Bucky Badger shirts, which I still might have a few, but they're starting to dwindle into black bear shirts and became bananas. And, you know, started out my career here as an assistant professor. So I invite you to consider what is your future hold as a black bear? Um, so we live in a gorgeous state. Um, these are pictures from Baxter State Park and then Acadia. And I also just wanted to say, put a plug in, if you, if you did not know, there is a brand new building that's going to be online in about two years. And biomedical engineering is going to get the entire third floor. We're going to have brand new research labs and brand new teaching spaces. And there's going to be a brand new biomedical optics suite in there. So it's just going to be really great times to consider being a black bear. We did have a question come up when you were talking about the seminar where you learned about the field you ended up going into. How did you find out about that seminar? Yeah, so that seminar was, um, I was applying for a program that allowed you to apply directly from high school into college and then provided that you kept a particular grade point average Etc. through college, you were automatically accepted into the University of Wisconsin Medical School. So it wasn't until I was sitting in that workshop to understand how to successfully apply, which I did not successfully apply to, I did not get in. Um, but that's where I learned about that, that entire major program. So Carissa, if you were sitting here as a high school student, how do you think you would find out about types of opportunities like that at, at UMaine? I know our UMaine admissions folks have a lot to offer. Yes, so I would say admissions is great. Um, you can also reach out to individual faculty members. Like I've hosted high school students doing research through UpScore. Um, we also, I wanna show you another thing. There is an upcoming camp this one's for middle schoolers, but there's also a program called Consider Engineering. Okay, you're not seeing my screen, I don't think. No, we're not. Okay, I'm, I'm working on getting it back. Okay. All right, I think I have it. So there's Consider Engineering for high school students. And if you're younger than high school, which some of you might be, there is a, 
The Maine Summer Transportation Institute camp this summer that is still accepting applications. So I am sharing this um, flyer with you. And if you have more questions, you can email Sheila Penzi at maine.edu and I can supply you that email address um, in the comments if you'd like. So those are two things that I would say um, are possible. Uh, I have hosted students for research stints during the academic year too. Obviously it's a lot harder if you're not living close to the campus, but um, I know one of them was a main math and science alliance school and she had a longer J term. So there's that possibility of, of doing it um, in that approach as well outside of summers. I do want to add that through our main 4-H program, we often do arrange tours and work with the College of Engineering at the University of Maine closely to at least get kids onto the campus and have them meet some of the faculty. So the College of Engineering at the University of Maine is very welcoming to having middle school and high school age visitors as well. Right now we can't due to the COVID situation, but hopefully we'll be able to bring more people to campus again soon. And we did have a question just come in. Do you work with students at UMaine? I do. So the reason I, I showed, I, I showcase on this slide. I work with both graduate and undergraduate students and I, I actually really like working with freshmen right out of the gate. Um, both of these students I worked as with as freshmen and one's entering their senior year and one just graduated. Um, so these are two examples of two undergrads that I've worked with. When would be an appropriate time to reach out to a faculty member if you were interested in working with them? Would it be after you've graduated from high school? Would it be once you've arrived at UMaine? Okay, you're talking about incoming students because I was like- Incoming students, I'm sorry. Incoming yeah. students because I was like, okay, because there's high school students, there's incoming students. Um, so in terms of incoming students, I would say like, go ahead and contact us right away after right right after you get accepted there's nothing stopping you from interacting with us already we we like interacting with you immediately i know you will there like in the fall so we have like if you're a biomedical engineering student we have um, a class that we all come in and actually show what our research areas are to you um, so that's one opportunity that you can see the widespread aspects of it um, and then maybe you you wait until after that if you want if you want to play on the side of safety um, otherwise you know you can just email us and we'll get back to you and tell tell you what we do Just a reminder, if you have any questions, you can type them right into the Q&A box. We'll give people uh, just another minute or so to think of those questions. I can also say, so this is super exciting, but Mitchell Harleen on this slide, he just got a $4,000 scholarship um, from SPIE Photonics West. And he's one of 78 students in the entire world to get this, this scholarship this year. Feels like you've answered everyone's questions as we went along. Jesse, are you seeing any more coming in? No, nope, we are all clear on this end. Awesome. Dr. Right. Tilbury, I really want to thank you for um, coming out today. This was awesome. This is, was probably the most high tech talk we've had too. And it's nice to highlight um, engineering. We have not really talked about engineering before today. I'm going to launch a quick evaluation poll for those of you who are um, 
our participants. I'd appreciate your impression of our session. And we are scheduling two more of these at this point. Next week, Dr. Caitlin Howell is going to join us to talk about engineering inspired by nature. And the following week, we have Dr. Tora Johnson, who's going to talk about natural disasters and mapping. So we're pretty excited about those. Um, that's going to be it for our spring quarantine virtual science cafes. We're wrapping this up as the school year wraps up. But we're hard at work at 4-H working on our main 4-H summer programming. Registration for summer offerings will be online on June 19th, and you can visit our website to learn more about that. And Dr. Tilbury, thanks again. I really appreciate you coming out and spending time with us today. This was a really awesome. Thank you for inviting me. It was great. I now have a main 4-H sweatshirt. That's right. From 4-H in, in, in Wisconsin to 4-H in Maine, we're mm -hmm. um, so glad you could, you could be here and share your pathway too. So thanks again, everybody. I hope you have a fantastic week.